This is the first part of sympatric speciation. Um, we've talked about just uh, macroevolution in general. We've talked about allopatric speciation, and now we're talking about sympatric speciation. Um, so reviewing the types of speciation. Obviously, we've talked about allopatric and sympatric. Uh, parapatric is obviously kind of meeting in the middle, um, going from totally being geographically separated to no geographic separation. In sympatric speciation, we see this occurring without geographic isolation, and so it occurs on a very local level. There's something in the environment keeping two groups of the same species apart, and they end up evolving away into two separate uh, species. Um, hab habitat differentiation is probably the most common um, reason that this occurs. Either they are feeding on a particular host or um, a, t a particular food source. Um, maybe a mutation has shown up that only allows them to f feed or exist in certain parts of the environment. Eventually, the species is divided into two groups, and given enough time, a long time, speciation can occur. So the physics of light and speciation, this is an, is an example that's going to be important. There are three primary colors of light, red, green, and blue. Um, this is sorted by frequency, right? Wavelengths move at a certain frequency. And so, right, we know the wavelength, the more frequent the wavelength, the more energy contained in that light. Uh, water molecules in the ocean tend to absorb reddish light, leaving the blue light to travel towards the depths of large bodies of water. Because of this, the deep ocean looks really blue, right? We know uh, the things that are absorbed do not show up, whereas what is reflected is actually the color that we see. So if I'm wearing a red shirt, that wavelength is actually being reflected towards you while the shirt fibers are actually absorbing all the other colors. <clears throat> um, this changes when the water is clouded by particles. Think about um, like silt in a lake or sand in a pond, any sort of sediment that... Um, is going to absorb bluish light, which is the opposite of the water molecules. Um, so when the sun shines on cloudy water, blue light is present near the surface, but just a few meters down, most of the blue light will have been absorbed, and mainly red light will penetrate, which is why not all bodies of water look very blue. It's very dependent upon how much sediment is present in the water. So this physics of light affects how blue the water is, but also which organisms are going to live in which layers, which is getting to my point about uh, macroevolution. The physics of light can lead to speciation because we see that based on how much sediment is present, we will see different organisms being able to thrive in different parts of the water. Um, in Africa's Lake Victoria, which is in uh, Tanzania, Kenya, I've been there. Um, we see that light penetrates at varying depths in Lake Victoria because we see that there's all different types of um, sediment amounts. There are more than 500 species of chichlid fish um, that have evolved from one species. The reason is that there are different uh, energy is being absorbed based on the amount of particles. And so depending on where the fish ends up being located, they will spend more of their time in either a very sediment heavy area, a very sediment low area. Um, like all populations, these fish had genetic variations and so it affects the fish's colors. Once they started spending time in an area where um, more fish of that same color were, they started breeding with each other and we see speciation starting to occur. Um, this leads them to potentially being uh, more suited for whatever type of water they're living in, uh, better finding food or spotting predators or being camouflaged. And so what started out as just preference of habitat actually led to natural selection and to the evolution of uh, color genes and speciation within this fish population. Um, Feel free to go through this a little bit more at your own leisure, but that is kind of the gist of uh, the physics of light and speciation. These are our little fish that we see and all the different variation in colors. <clears throat> Other reasons that we see sympatric speciation, uh, the term polyploidy we've talked about quite a bit. It refers to instant speciation, which occurs most often in plants. Uh, polyploidy cells and organisms are those containing more than two pairs of chromosomes. Um, this occurs due to abnormal cell division, either during 
mitosis, but most often during meiosis because we know that crossing over happens. And when those chromosomes are lined up um, they and attached to do a little crossing over, they might pull a full chromosome over. Um, autoploidy refers to the occurrence in which the number of chromosomes double in the offspring due to what we call non-disjunction during meiosis. Um, this was discovered by someone who was studying primroses. He noticed some of them were much larger and very hardy. <clears throat> uh, the normal primrose plant has 14 chromosomes. Um, it's a 2N or a diploid cell. Um, but some of these species ended up with um, double the amount, uh, 28. They were tetraploid. Tetra means four. And um, these primroses cannot successfully mate with the 2N version. And so um, over the course of one generation, we end up with a new species because it can no longer mate. It probably looks very similar, but uh, it cannot mate with the original primrose plant. Um, this is the mechanism for autoploidy, polyploidy. A diploid plant becomes tetraploid or 4N. The offspring look very much like the diploid plant, but they are much more, uh, they are much larger and more vigorous and capable of um, growing much more quickly. Uh, they also are not capable of reproducing the 2N organism, right? That's a um, prezygotic barrier, uh, not being able to match up the number of chromosomes, and therefore it is considered a different species, and it can happen over one generation. Allopolyploidy are polyploids with chromosomes derived from different species. Um, and so uh, essentially what can happen is we see the union of two gametes, a sperm and an egg, from two different species that are very similar but have the same um, or have a different number. Um, and so we end up with a viable fertile hybrid with an allopolyploidy amount of um, chromosomes. This is very uncommon but it usually has to do with two very closely related species mating. And we know we've skipped over all the pre- and post-zygotic barriers to get a viable fertile hybrid, which in itself is very rare. <clears throat> um, other ways that we see sympatric speciation, we see chromosomal rearrangement. Uh, we do this artificially most often. We started synthesizing new plant species in labs in the 19th century. Um, making a kind of wheat and rye cross was one of the first uh, synthetic plants. It had a really high yield and a good grain quality and was very disease resistant um, and resistant to deficiencies in the soil. Uh, essentially, we wheat and rye do not have the same amount of chromosomes, but we kind of like reworked it in the lab so that it was a new species. It could reproduce with itself and pollinate itself and um, and produce more food for us. <clears throat> uh, it was also found that this also happens in nature. Um, it appeared that uh, there are some random changes in chromosome structure that don't result in a lethal zygote or a fertilized egg that, that dies. Um, the most common example is a grasshopper, um, and it was more fit for certain areas uh, they are called flightless grasshoppers, and for whatever reason, their chromosomes rearranged in such a way it was a big mutation, um, and basically they were capable of surviving and reproducing in a very small environment and passing on their chromosomes, and we have a new species. So we've looked at a couple different ways that sympatric speciation can occur. Uh, the question is, how quickly does this happen, right? Because a lot of those examples talked about, like, this mutation occurred and suddenly we see a new species. And there are two theories on how evolution occurs and the tempo of evolution. The first is gradualism. This idea is basically revolving around the fact that speciation is really slow. Even if I see a mutation, it takes a long time for um, the, those individuals with the mutation to reproduce, produce more offspring with that mutation, for them to reproduce, to pr produce more offspring. And so the population slowly accumulates changes as it evolves away from the original species. We call it gradualism. Um, there is the other theory called punctuated equilibrium. This idea is that there is one very specific change that allows for speciation to occur. It occurs over one generation, and then that species is in, um, isolated from the original species. Um, 
And so basically we go a long time with seeing no changes, then suddenly a big change occurs, a new species is formed, it continues on its way. Um, for the most part, a species exists in a, an extended state called stasis, um, and then there's some sort of crisis in the environment or some sort of big change in the population size, um, bottleneck effect, something like that, and we see a very quick change. Um, fossil records support both of these things. There's no true answer to which is the case, although there is more evidence for um, gradualism. And this kind of looks like what it would look like, right? Uh, gradualism, lots and lots of changes slowly over a long time, uh, punctuated equilibrium, a very specific change with lots of stasis in between.